the combustion of all fossil fuels leads to some air pollution. In this presentation, we will look at the air pollution specifically from the consumption of petroleum for transportation. Sources of air pollution can be classified as either fixed, and that would be, for example, factories or power plants, and mobile, and that would be automobiles, trucks, transportation sources. We'll be looking in this presentation at mobile sources of pollution, and this will be mostly cars and light trucks. Most of the vehicles on the road, and in fact off the road, are powered by some kind of internal combustion engine. This means we bring in a fuel, uh, often diesel fuel or gasoline, and also bring in air and combust the two together. As a result of this combustion, there is air pollution, some of it because of the fuel itself causing, making chemical combinations, which would then be air pollution, and some of it nitrogen gas coming in as part of the air supply, and that also producing pollution products. The atmosphere has two basic levels. The troposphere, where we live and breathe, and where we emit pollution into the atmosphere, into the troposphere. And above the troposphere, the stratosphere, stratosphere we mostly know about because that's where there is the ozone layer that protects us from ultraviolet radiation. The atmosphere throughout is about 80% nitrogen gas and about 20% oxygen and a little bit of other things including carbon dioxide and other chemicals. In the troposphere, the higher up you go in elevation, the cooler it gets. So if you were to climb a mountain, as you, as you approach the peak, the cooler the air would become. This means for pollution that if you emit dirty, polluted air at low levels, it will rise up in the atmosphere and expand as it goes upward and spread outward and become more diluted. However, if there is a temperature inversion, which is shown on the right-hand side in this picture, uh, that is a warm layer sitting above the, the surface, then the uh, dirty air cannot rise up and you get a pollution problem. This is called a temperature inversion. This is a photo of a temperature inversion. That is, you can actually see that where the, te the inversion layer is, it's above this dirty, smoggy layer and that traps this dirty air within the lower part of the troposphere. This can be a problem, and this can be the cause of a major episode of air pollution or smog. It's particularly bad in places where the, uh, the, the air in the city, the air in the polluting area, is trapped on both sides by mountains. So this happens in LA, it happens in Mexico City, and in many other places. Automobile tailpipes emit four kinds of pollutants. There's carbon monoxide, which is caused by incomplete combustion of the fuel. It's one of the reasons why uh, alcohol or ethanol is added to gasoline because it's an oxidizer. Uh, the other is are compounds of nitrogen, oxide compounds of nitrogen. There's nitrogen oxide and nitrogen dioxide. And uh, these are caused by nitrogen, which enters the cylinder and uh, is oxidized uh, during the process by which fuel is burned. Then there's volatile organic compounds, VOCs. These are from uh, gasoline and engine oil. And then there's particulates, SPM, suspended particulate matter. Uh, and this basically are caused by particulates during the combustion process or uh, aerosols produced during the combustion process. Pollution from automobiles together with pollution from other sources cause photochemical smog. Uh, it's photochemical because ultraviolet light and usually high temperatures are needed to make the smog form. Uh, so the uh, nitrogen oxide compounds, the so-called NOx, and the VLCs combine together to produce ozone in the atmosphere. This is bad ozone, it's in the troposphere, not like good ozone, which is up in the stratosphere. It's the same compound, but it's, it's bad when it's in the atmosphere and we have to breathe it. Uh, and then uh, 
the SPMs go to uh, form particulate matter and aerosols, and those together make smog. Smog is very unhealthy uh, because of the particulates and also because of the ozone. All of these affect our lung tissue, very unhealthy for humans and also for uh, other organisms. Here's a uh, picture of uh, smog in an urban area. Uh, and as you can see, it's pretty heavy smog. There's probably an inversion layer over this holding the smog in place. Uh, this is unhealthy. Uh, and there would be normally ozone alerts to uh, let people know that, 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 that this is unsafe to be really outside and you need to be inside where uh, there's some filtering against this. Uh, or you need to lower your activities. You shouldn't be outside running, for example, during a uh, ozone alert. The other air pollution product is formation of acid rain. This is more associated with emissions from power plants and factories uh, because it's more associated with the SO2, the sulfur dioxide that's emitted by these uh, fixed sources, but also the, the uh, NO2 the, uh, that's emitted from as a result of uh, automobile uh, emissions uh, will also contribute to the formation of acid rain. So these uh, SO2 and uh, NO2 together uh, uh, with moisture in clouds form uh, a acid liquid that can actually fall as acid rain or that can be dry deposition. All of this is bad for people. Uh, and also unhealthy for trees. Uh, and when it gets into, say, a, a small lake, it can turn the lake acidic. Here's a, a forest which has been greatly damaged by acid rain. Uh, so this is one of the problems. Uh, for example, in the New England area, there are large areas of Vermont that have been affected by acid rain, particularly at higher elevations. Uh, some mountain lakes uh, become acidic and therefore uh, uh, can no longer support uh, the normal uh, life uh, that would be in these lakes at higher elevation. Uh, so this is a problem. It can be mostly solved by measures uh, that stop the emission of SO2 and also uh, nitrogen oxide compounds. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency was formed in 1970 uh, its main role was to, and it continues to be, to enforce the provisions of the Clean Air Act, the CAA. Uh, and as we will see, the EPA has been very successful at, at, at its task of cleaning up the air in America, in, Amer in, in the U.S. in general, and particularly in American cities. Uh, if you had uh, or knew somebody who visited uh, California 20 years ago or 30 years ago, the pollution was extreme. I say LA smog was, uh, was, it was intense, uh, and now it's been greatly reduced. There's still problem areas, as we'll see, but it's the, the areas of air pollution in the U.S. have been greatly reduced. Here's the process by which the EPA enforces the Clean Air Act. It has six criteria pollutants, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, lead, particulate matter, and ozone. And it monitors the amount of this in the atmosphere. So there are measuring stations at many places uh, throughout the United States. Most of them are in bigger cities where pollution is expected to be more intense. And they monitor, that is, they measure the amount of each of these criteria pollutants. And there is a maximum pollutant level that's allowed, and when these go above that pollutant level, then that particular location, usually a city location, is said to be in non-compliance with the provisions of the Clean Air Act. So for example, if we look at the United States, we see areas here in red and yellow uh, and blue, which are areas which have uh, are not in compliance with the Clean Air Act for various reasons. And they're just where you think they would be. They're uh, LA area, the Southern California, along the East Coast, 
uh, from uh, New Jersey up through Boston. Uh, and as you can see, there's a particularly bad area uh, around Houston. So these are areas where there's uh, a great deal of uh, population, great deal of automobile uh, use, and also uh, there are power plants that supply electrical needs. So this is a, uh, uh, these are problem areas, all of which probably uh, most of these areas, are, I should say, are under non-compliance, and they have, they have provisions that they have to meet in order to get back into compliance. After the monitoring procedure has shown that a site is not in compliance with the National Ambient Air Quality Standard, then something has to be done about that. And what has to be done is that emission from stationary sources and uh, mobile sources have to be reduced. With automobiles, the emission standards, therefore, are set. And for example, with a new Camry, the emission standards are those shown in this uh, table. Uh, there is, and each of these emission standards have to do with the grams of pollutants that can be emitted per mile. These are the maximums that can be emitted per mile. You can see there's a standard, the standards for carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide compounds, non-methane uh, organic gases, and formaldehyde. These are quite low. Uh, in fact, this is the uh, ultra low uh, emission uh, standard. Uh, and, if, and in the future, the standards will get even lower. So there has been a lot of progress, uh, but we still need to reduce these standards, as, uh, the levels of these standards, as much as we can. Now, in existing cars and trucks, the Emission standards are enforced through uh, a number of different emission control systems in your vehicle. Uh, the chief one among these is the catalytic converter. The catalytic converter takes these compounds uh, that we're concerned about uh, and converts them to harmless compounds uh, through chemistry with inside uh, the catalytic converter. Catalytic means that there are compounds in the inside this device which causes a catalysis that is a, 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 a rapid change of this of these compounds into benign compounds it's a very important device it sits in your car it's worth about 500 bucks probably in some cities and states because of non-compliance with the provisions of the clean air act it's necessary to do tailpipe testing and this actually will measure the amount of emissions coming out of the tailpipe of this uh, vehicle. And if it if it's, doesn't meet the standard, then that, that vehicle would have to be modified so that it meets the standards. This is generally, this strategy is the command and control strategy. That is the uh, government, state, and federal have really control over what automobiles can emit. So it's a command and control strategy so this is an important kind of policy to keep in mind that can be done with these particular uh, kinds of devices and these particular emitters the epa has taken the position that co2 is a pollutant it's not your typical pollutant it doesn't do direct harm the way uh, sulfur dioxide or nitrogen oxide will do or ozone would do which is a secondary pollutant uh, but it is a pollutant in the sense that it causes damage to our climate and to human health indirectly uh, so therefore in order to curtail the amount of co2 emission uh, the epa has a tailpipe rule which basically sets mileage standards that is basically automobile efficiency says how much emission a car can co2 emission a car can emit per mile we'll look at this quite a bit in the next section of this course but uh, it's a different approach to looking at uh, co2 looking at it as a pollutant